stimulant, she's supposed to put that away two hours before she goes to sleep. TV's off an hour beforehand. Correct. Yes. <laughs> Correct. Absolutely. And I'll be honest with you, it's about eight to ten slides down about how to reduce the stimuli and how that affects people with dementia. <laughs> so, but you're right. Absolutely. Stimu there's too much stimulation in the world. There's too much noise. And it really affects how people, uh, it'll take this level of uh, dementia up to here. Okay. Uh, New problems with word speaking, trouble understanding the visual images. Like I said, with the alcohol induced, my friend's dad will walk into the wall. He'll see the door and just walk because it's kind of like taking your fingers. You ever do that pencil trick where you have the pencil and you wave it up and down so it looks like the pencil's flexible? Oh, come on. You guys have done that, haven't you? I don't have a pencil. So you can take a pencil and put it in your fingers and just wave it up and down, and you know the pencil's straight, right? But you do it about this, and it looks like the pencil's a piece of rubber. That's what a person with dementia, a little bit more flexibility in the wrist there. And a, a pencil works a lot better. So. Misplacing things. We talked about the keys. We have clients' daughters call us all the time and say, your caregiver stole this from my mom. And we'll call the caregiver and the caregiver says, nope, it's down in the basement on the fourth shelf behind this. Because they start hiding things. They're not misplaced, they're saying, oh, I don't want my daughter, and they take it and put it up on the shelf. And I, we train our caregivers very carefully to watch, to see where the hiding places are because people will be working and all of a sudden they'll get up because they're very concerned. Okay? So they'll walk, they'll pick something up and they'll take it and they'll go, I better, just a second. <laughs> During church next week, everybody going, what's that noise? Who turned on their phone? Okay? They will start hiding things. They'll misplace things. We call it hiding They'll start wearing the pens. And then you'll walk in their house. And after a while, you'll, what is that smell? What is that smell? And daughter's like, I don't know, just, you know, maybe something died in the chimney. And we go in there and we open up the guest room's closet door and there are a pile of the pens this high. Because they're hiding things. They don't want anybody to know. Okay, they have this in their mind. They have changes in mood, withdrawal from work or social behaviors. And this happens every day. And I could give you, I mean, by doing this for 16 years, I have about 200 caregivers. We go into about 300 people seniors homes. Not all seniors, but I'll say seniors at this current time. And almost every I would say about 80 to 85% of our clients have some form of dementia that are our long-term clients. We take care of a lot of people coming out of surgeries and those kind of things just to get them back up on their feet. But our long-term clients, I can go almost give you a name and say this one has one, five, seven, and nine of these and how you, we should be working with that client and when they start changing. So as you changes in moods and personalities, they'll go from happy as can be to just mad as can be that you're in their house. I'm so happy to see you. You go in, make their coffee, come back out, and they are screaming bloody murder at you 
Who are you? Why are you in my house? I'm calling the police. Uh, we get the police called us on, on us all the time. And the police know. And with all the, the police start knowing. Yeah, we'll just show up, walk in, say, hey. So changes in moods. And this can be really from, you have your early onset dementia, your middle and your end stage. And we'll talk about what goes on each one of in that middle stage. This is when it becomes so hard because they go from clarity to dementia. And it can happen over days, weeks, months to one second. One thing can set them off. Stim stimuli can set them off. So, as the dementia advances, yeah, yes, ma'am, before. I was, uh, when you talk about depression, um, all depression, does all depression, uh, is it all connected to Alzheimer's or is depression, I'm thinking of a nursing home uh, situation that um, I worked in nursing for a number of years and uh, there were, I should, shouldn't throw out, but let's say 85% of those people were depressed because of the situation they were in. They left their home, that was theirs. Mm -hmm. and I've never heard anybody say, I can't wait to move to a nursing home. And I mean, when we go in people's homes, they're like, you do everything you can to keep me out of there. And then usually a lot of times in two weeks, we're, we're with them in the nursing home. But the best thing, instead of antidepressants for somebody with depression is one thing, a smile. If they could get their staff to smile at them and actually spend time with the client, that those depression, it's proven, it's a proven fact. Uh, but yes, people that go into nursing homes, they do have depression. Does not mean they're going to get uh, dementia. Depression is 100% a different, but if you are depressed, your chances increase amazingly to get, yes sir. There's a commercial on TV now where this gentleman was talking That would be a commercial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you, the studies show this so much, the newer facilities going up no longer look like the nursing homes of old. They're bright painted, they're big rooms, you can get individual rooms, uh, the bright colors. The older ones you walk through, what colors are they? Drab, beige. Now they got, the halls are a different color and all those kind of things. And also, and I'll, just one second, you will also find ones that are assisted livings to nursing homes, to memory units in the same facilities that are being built in the same exact mode. So there's no change to the person. So I moved into a facility, an assisted living with just a touch of dementia. When I got it a little bit worse and I needed to go to a nursing home, I would just move hallways, but my room would look exactly the same. All the pictures would be the same, the exact same color, the dressing, the steps from the bed to the bathroom would be exactly the same. And then when I went into the memory unit, I would have the exact same things because that transition can really change the person's dementia from going from a home to a facility. All of a sudden, it's a different world. From home to a hospital has a huge effect of all of a sudden, their dementia may be very mild, it may kick them past moderate, just going into the hospital. And that familiarity, we tell the family, go with them, go sit with them, stay there and talk to them, or our same caregiver, just for that familiarity, the voice, the talking, the conversation. So yes, just a second, I believe. Yeah. Yep. 
the continuum of care. They, they'll start assist, or independent living, apartment living, to assisted living where they're getting a bath, medication reminders, yep, all the way through uh, end of life. Yes, ma'am. Well, every dementia is different. So it's usually at the end of moderate into end stage with Alzheimer's. So, but every, every person is different. And that's the hardest thing about dementia is if I have a hundred clients that have dementia, every one of them are at different stage. One will become very mild mannered. They might've been the grumpiest old man in the world. And now they're the most loving person in the world. Every, every, that's the hardest thing about dementia. Well, to me, being a family member of somebody with dementia is the hardest thing in the world. The person with dementia, after they get to moderate, it doesn't bother them at all. It's the family and those loved ones around them that dementia affects more than anything. That first part's when you realize, hey, my mind's gonna be going. That's very hard. And then they get that point, they don't realize it anymore. And the spouse, the loved one that's been with you for 60, 70, 80 years, uh, it becomes very hard on them. When the family met, when the daughter comes in and they say, who are you? And they're saying to our caregiver, have you met my daughter, Susan? And the daughter just walked in the door and they're like, I don't know who you are. Why are you here? That's when it becomes hard. So on here, you'll see the arrow going back and forth. As I mentioned, every client, every person, and I'm sorry, I call them, for me, I call them clients, <laughs> but it's a person. So I apologize when I say client. It goes back and forth. I can't tell you what comes first or what comes last because everyone's different. So when you look at those things, you may find this person's doing this and this person's doing separate. So lose the ability to express their needs, inability to understand what somebody's saying to them. You can't teach them. No longer can you teach them. All you may be able to do is bring up old memories once they get there. Uh, ability to navigate their world. My office for comfort keepers was on 103rd and 4th. We're sitting in the office and this lady pulls in, probably 70, 75, pulls in, sits here for about five minutes. And usually when that happens, I go out and talk to somebody, but I was on the phone. I was just watching this lady and she was just sitting there and she was going through her stuff. Uh, I got off the phone and she comes walking in the door. She goes, can you guys help me? She goes, I can't find my grocery store. I'm like, can't find your grocery store? You know, did, I work with it every day. Didn't even dawn to me. Can't find your grocery store. Which one are you looking for? The one in Council Bluffs. I'm on 103rd and Fort. She goes, I have been driving around. I can't find my grocery store. I think they closed it. So I started talking to her. Through this, she had been driving around looking for this. And I said, what's your address? Do you have somebody I can call? She goes, why? I said, do you have a family member or somebody? Because you're way over here and something's happened. Can I give you a ride? My, my secretary would drive your car and I'll give you a ride home. She finally gave me her daughter's number. I called her and talked to her and she goes, We've taken everything else away, but I didn't want to take away her car because she goes two places, church and the grocery store. I said, well, her grocery store is a block and a half from her house and she's in West Omaha. I'm not worried about her. I'm worried about the 5,000 people she passed on the interstate or driving through the communities. I said, we've got to change something. And you know, she goes, I didn't realize that bad. I'll take her to the doctor. She took her to the doctor. She called me back a week later. She thanked me. She actually moved in with her mom to help take care of her. So, uh, oops, I'm gonna go back because the stimulation. And we're gonna talk about that in a second. So how much time do I have? Just keep going. I got all day, I got nothing else to do other than the masters, but. So stages of dimension, I'll go through these a little bit quicker. So early stage, they feel like they're having memory lapses. They forget familiar words or locations or where the objects are. 
okay? A uh, hard time with math and paying bills. Do not require any care. They can handle it. It's just all those annoying little things, okay? So mid-stage, this is when it starts becoming difficult. This is when they start getting more and more frustrated with themselves and with others. And a lot of the uh, frustration with others is because you try to help, people try to help people with dementia too much. They get frustrated because I've always been able to do this by myself. And uh, oh, here, let me get this for you. You need what? Let me go get that. And you start figuring out their problems for them or what their needs are. This is when they get very frustrated. They get moody. They get at, they don't want the daughter around anymore. This is when we get a call from the daughter saying, my mom doesn't want me there anymore. Would you, and they're like, I don't understand why they love your care, love your caregiver so much. Because we're not there to do things for them. We train them to do things with them. So when you're working with somebody with dementia, do things with them, not for, especially in this stage. All right, so when you look through those things, uh, three o'clock in the morning, when I started my business 16 years ago, it was a two-person show. So I hired, I trained, I did sales, um, I did on-call because we're open 24-7. Uh, I did everything. And then I got a client that taught me I need to hire somebody to be on call. Because at three o'clock in the morning, every morning, I got a call from this lady. Where's my caregiver? I'm like, and Ethel, it's three o'clock in the morning. My caregiver's supposed to be here at three. Where is she? So after about six nights of this, I called her daughter and says, uh, we need to get some help in there overnight. She goes, yeah, why? Because she stopped calling me. She was up all night. The daughter's like, this is great. She stopped calling me. Well, she started calling me. <laughs> so we switch that around very often. This is when they become suspicious. They start hiding things like we talked about and they will hide stuff. We've cleaned out, helped families clean out after death. You couldn't throw one thing away because when you opened it up, money fell. Letters fell, bills fell, everything was hidden, okay? Losing objects, is, this is when they start becoming dangerous to be at home. And then end stage. This is really when they're non-functional. They need help with everything bathing and continence, transferring, mobility, eating, feeding, uh, trouble remembering to swallow. We have uh, staff that sits here when they feed them something, oops, sorry, that rubs their throat to help them remember to swallow. Because they'll sit there with just applesauce in their mouth. So you sit there and then they start, then they'll swallow. So every behavior has a meaning. When they can't communicate it to you, you have to be the detective. Wandering, abusive, physically and verbally, like somebody asks, aggressive. They become agitated, they became anxious. When they can't communicate it to you, saying, my big toe hurts, what do you think they do? They squirm, okay? When something, they may start tapping their foot. So you have to watch what to do. When you're watching somebody with dementia and you see their moodiness change, are they hungry? So the next, so, oops, I'm gonna go to the next, this one and then I'll go back. What we talk about is you always have to be a detective. So when you're looking, talking uh, at the post office, talking to somebody, you have to be a detective. When you walk in, when you're seeing your mom, when you're walking across the hallway and meeting your friend and these things are going on, What's happening? When's the last time they ate or drank? The last time they went to the bathroom. Do they wear glasses or hearing aids? Are they yelling at you? Well, maybe they didn't put their hearing aids in because <laughs> they don't know it. <laughs> uh, are they comfortable? Fidgeting. Fidgeting is a huge item for people with dementia. Are they tugging? Are they doing this? Okay, because they don't have their hearing aids in and they're so used to them being there. They can't tell you. That's, 
sometimes it's losing their inhibitions. They're sensory, they don't know they're screaming. Um, it could be their loss of hearing, because they, when people start losing their hearing, what happens? They start talking louder and louder because they can't hear themselves. So it kind of depends on what stage of dementia they're in, what kind of dementia they have, and the worst thing is, we may never know, because I can't tell you. It's their inhibitions. Yep. Yeah. It's all those signs I talked about, and those, those, those things, it just, you never know why. Maybe their dad cussed all the time. You, you just don't know. Something has triggered something that has done that. Sometimes people will reenact what they saw on TV yesterday. So if they watched a movie, the stimuli, and they see that, you never, it's, things kick you and you don't know why. So, um, are they out of the routine or are they bored? So here's probably the biggest, best slide because you're not going to educate somebody. You're not going to change what they do, right? So when somebody's acting out or doing certain things, are they yelling? First thing you have to consider, are they hurting themselves? And I kind of compare this to um, young couples in a grocery store when their kids are having fun. And you hear the mom or the dad uh, start yelling at their kid because the kid's having fun, not bothering anybody. And the mom's like, stop, because what's happening? The kid's embarrassing mom, right? I'm like, let the kid go. <laughs> you know, you see them out doing certain things, they're having fun, they're playing in the mud. Who cares? Are they hurting somebody? To a certain extent. <laughs> uh, does the behavior put you at risk? Put you or them at risk? If not, let them do it. My first story is, pass the salt. Pass me the salt. Can I have the salt? And the daughter said, you don't want the salt. You want sugar. I just want the salt. Is that putting anybody at risk because she's asking for salt instead of sugar? Give them the sugar. Heck, even if she puts salt in her coffee, who cares? Right? So, step into the world. Have empathy. Power of touch. Now, you got to be careful with this one because if you're new to that person and they do show signs of aggression, you don't want to go straight up. And I do this a lot. When I walk in, I talk to somebody. I know they have dementia. And I'm going to use, can I use you an example? So when I walk up sometimes and I'm walking in for the first time and I come in and sit and I'll say, hi, I'm Rick, how are you? And I'll sit there and I just hold the hand. And it's amazing. And I'm not a good looking guy, but I feel I melt more women's hearts when I just go in and hold their hand. And I will sit there and talk about our care and what we can do. And they will hold my hand for 45 minutes. And the daughter or sons will say, they're never this calm. What did you do? And I've sat there just holding her hand. And if you guys can't see, I'm moving my thumb just a little bit. Power of a touch. Now also I've done some guys that don't do it that, they don't like that. So I'll come up and pat them on their shoulder. When my grandma died at 98, my grandpa was 90, 98 also. He was sitting in a chair, he had dementia. And he kept asking, when's my wife coming home? When my, I'm sorry, this one chokes me up because I never even thought about this till about five years ago. And I use this story and all of a sudden I just start bawling. <laughs> because my grandpa is 98. I just walked up, sat down to him, and I put my shoulder, and he stopped crying. That's all I did. And then I got down on a knee. The power of touch. But the other thing I did is, I got on his level. I didn't stand over him. I'm now a threat. Here, I comforted him. Okay, I still have this barrier if he wants it. Then I got down on his level, and I talked on his level a little bit deeper. 
people with dementia don't hear high pitches as well. They hear lower, lower, lower. Okay? Don't ever argue. Don't confront them because you're never going to win. Has anybody ever been around a client with dementia that you won an argument? If so, you're one of the first. Because you're not going to win because you're not going to change your mind. Okay? Make direct eye contact. The worst thing to do is this. Yeah, and what kind of coffee do you want? Do you want any tea in your coffee or what do you need? You know what they just heard? The Charlie Brown teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Okay? Look at them. Talk to them. Take your time. Um, redirect. I'll go through these. I'm going way over. I apologize. I'm, talking, I'm telling my stories a little bit more than I should. Uh, the things that trigger them. Pet peeves. Were they um, simple choices? You want coffee, tea, water, or pop? They heard one thing. Do you want... You know what they want, figure it out, take them a glass of water. Don't give them choices. Do you want to eat? You hungry? Nope. Nope. It's kind of like my kids. Hey, you want to go to a movie with us? Nope. You're going to a movie with us. We're going to, I don't even know a movie yet, Batman. Okay? Don't give them a choice. Okay? Give them one, maybe two. Not, are you ready to eat? John, it's time to eat. Not, hey, do you want to take a bath? <laughs> I, that's 99.9% .9 of the time with somebody with dementia. No. And if they still say no, give them with something after that. I'll use a simple example. I love ice cream. You can tell. Love it. You tell me if I have dementia, Let's go have some ice cream after we take a bath. You know what I heard? Ice cream. I'll jump in that tub. I'm done, man. I'm gonna get some ice cream. I've already warned my kids. Just put ice cream from me. I'll get to do whatever you want. Okay? Physically remove. And this goes into the next one. Turn off the TV. Go for a walk. Go to a different room. It's amazing how many houses I go into. In this room, they have the TV going. In this room, the radio's going. The dogs are barking. And it's constant stimulation coming at them. And you wonder why they're agitated. I think I'm pretty sane. I get agitated with the TV on. <laughs> you know, all the noises. What's wrong with quiet? Get them around, away from all the blue noise. Quiet, give them a book. And if you sit in a house with a, and just hand them a book, whether they can read it or not, they're going to act like they're reading it in a lot of cases. They will sit there and flip through pages after pages and maybe not understand one word they read. Apologize. If you spill the milk on the table and I'm sitting there, I'm going to say, I'm sorry, that's my fault. I'm sorry. Don't say, why'd you spill the milk? Agitation. Take the blame. Uh, this is my biggest one right here. If you take nothing else out of this whole conversation is have a relationship before you worry about the task. If you can't get him to take a bath, don't push it. It's still your friend, your spouse, your loved one. Sit down and watch Wheel of Fortune with him for a while. Relationship before task. There are so many things. Yes, you want them to go do this. You want them to get this done. You want them to make, get a bath, get dressed, get this. But it doesn't matter. Who cares if they sit around in their pajamas all day? What does it matter if they get dressed or not? If you can get them to do it, great. If you can't, does it put them at risk? Is it annoying to you? Yes, but who cares? Okay. You did? <laughs>
Absolutely. Absolutely. How frustrating was that for you? Very frustrating. But it's what does it matter, right? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. No. Dementia is the is uh, the 108 classifications. Alzheimer's is one of those diseases. So when people say they have Alzheimer's, they may have Lewy bodies, but the Alzheimer's has the biggest fundraising, the biggest network. So everybody says you have Alzheimer's. No, you don't. You have Lewy bodies, but it doesn't really matter. It does in the way you work with them somewhat. Okay. Um, Communication techniques kind of went over this already. Um, so this is, if you go through this slide, this is how to communicate with somebody. Take it slow and talk to the person. If there's eight people at the table, when I go around with my father-in-law, I sit by him because I'm the only person of the whole family that will sit there and talk to him. Everybody else just talks and then they say, right, Grandpa? He doesn't get any of that. He gets so frustrated, but I sit there and look at him and talk to him on his level. Of course, I'm trained in it. Nobody else is, okay? Uh, know who the person was, what's important to them. Like I said, those pictures, they feed back into the past. Those are great conversations. My Aunt Polly lived down in Louisville. I took her to lunch once a month. She told me the same story 150 times in an hour lunch about her and my dad going fishing. 150 times every 10 seconds it was a rewind and I asked my dad about it he goes because he's from Kansas he goes we went up there once remembered it and my kids I said my kids would go to lunch with me I said have fun with it ask what kind of fish do you have what'd you do this how'd you do this and she would go into the whole story oh we didn't do that so you can have fun uh, going through uh, the last one their tools are limited. They don't have the whole tool shed anymore. What do they still have left? Enjoy that part of that with them. If it's the short or the long-term memory of something that happened in 1940, 